Today's session is not a training session. We have many different attendees on the call today with probably different setups and different objectives, maybe even a different workflow for closing the year end. So the purpose of our call today is to inform, to educate, and to give you a checklist of items to make sure that your year end process goes smoothly. When we begin to look at um, X3, and most people have been working with it for quite a while, um, you know, the idea is, so what are some of the things that we should be aware of moving forward towards year end? And, and we're all going to put our financials hat on in, uh, just for today uh, to think about the concept of closing. So there are monthly closings and then there are, there are annual closings. So from today's perspective, what I'd like to touch on are some of the general ledger posting controls, and, and there's something called a checklist. I will share with you that if one has not been provided to you, just reach out to me, and I would be more than glad to send you that document so you have something to uh, wrestle with and just have your own formal checklist that you can use. Uh, we're going to talk about why you need to use a, product, a solution or piece of functionality called the year-end simulation. Uh, and by the way, this is really for making it so that you don't necessarily have to close out the year, but all of your opening balances for the next year get forwarded in a simulated mode. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, period and year-end closing and opening processes. And we're going to talk about uh, something that we refer to as the journals. Uh, some little known tidbits about journals is that, you know, sometimes you'll start uh, reporting entries next year and the system comes back and says, no can do, the journals are not open. Uh, and that's because uh, there's a little known piece of functionality from years gone by with X3 where there used to be uh, subsidiary ledgers or sub-journals that could be opened or closed. And that's there for the different legislations that we go into. Uh, most of you won't run across that because whenever we install X3, we usually open up the journals for about the next 50 years so you don't have to worry about that, but it could occur. Financial data extraction and reporting considerations. You know, your balance sheets, your uh, P&Ls, your cash flow statements, whatever it is that you're pulling out of X3, uh, if you're using the, the uh, financial data extraction tool within a solution, or, you know, we refer to that as the FDE uh, within X3, there are some little things that you should be aware of with that. But at the same time, if you're using um, Sage Enterprise Intelligence or uh, Sage Intelligence or some other financial reporting tool, uh, just you know, keep in consideration that dates and periods do mean things within the solution. And then when you're running your year-end closure, it will record specific journal entries that you may want to know could have an impact on your financial reports. Well, and then I also want to talk about 1099 generation and reporting. Uh, functionality was uh, fairly new in version 6. It's uh, now standard in version 6, moving forward, version 7, so on and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, you know, that, that's something where people will ask the question, well, do we need to worry about any updates to reports? You know, keep in mind that X3 doesn't print out a 1099 uh, form, per se, uh, but you can map that over to whatever stock the government is issuing today. That's a crystal report function, keep that in mind. Uh, but it will print out uh, some forms that can be used uh, to send that regardless of whether it's a 1099 uh, official printed form or not. Talk a little bit about fixed asset contexts. Now, the people that are using fixed assets, they probably already know that you have to close your fixed asset periods as well as your standard um, uh, general ledger periods and years. Uh, so there's a series of steps that you need to, to go through with that. Make sure you close those out accordingly. Uh, and uh, one thing to, to point out is that from a fixed asset context perspective, uh, X3 won't let you close out the year if you're using fixed assets and there are any transactions or postings that need to be recorded from your fixed asset solution. So a nice little thing to, to keep in mind that X3 is going to keep us all honest. And then something that a lot of us tend to forget about is something called an inventory cost transfer and update. You know, how do you manage uh, your current cost uh, changes going from uh, last year to next year and what's the timing of that? Uh, you know, how, what are some of the, the things that you should look for to make sure that that's being managed appropriately and maybe some tips about how we can help you uh, move that into an area that you can 
uh, massage the numbers and then turn them loose and make them your new standards for next year. And then last but not least, general parameter and user configuration settings. Let's talk a little bit about that one just uh, before we move into the next slide because there are a couple of different parameters out there under your general parameters that, that drive date ranges. Uh, so just make sure that you know that some of those date ranges have to be moved forward or they can actually prevent people from logging into the system. Move on to the next slide here. All right, let's talk about the year-end checklist. Now, when you start to think about your daily, weekly, monthly, and year-end procedures, you know, some of the things stand true whether it's the end of a period or the end of the month. For example, making sure that all of your shipments are posted, okay, validated. You know how there's a validation button at the bottom of the shipment screen. But there's also a utility out there that you can run that will basically post all of the shipments that haven't been posted yet. So that's kind of a nice little catch-all unless your procedures dictate that you have to do each shipment one at a time. You know, keep in mind, though, that if the shipments haven't been posted to the ledger and they're in that prior period, uh, you won't be able to close the period out because the shipment still needs to either have the dates moved out uh, where you're saying, no, it did not ship, or you need to post that to the ledger. At the same time, uh, the uh, stock accounting interface, fun with uh, STO, ACC, you know, fun with stock accounting and inventory, and make sure that that's running. Most of us have that set up as a batch that runs nightly, uh, so you shouldn't have to necessarily worry about that. But sometimes that batch function may accidentally shut down, and you'll probably know uh, that it is shut down because all of a sudden cost of goods sold is not being updated in the system. So keep an eye out for that. The other one is related to purchase invoices or, or credit memos. Again, there are two types of purchase invoices. There's the supplier invoice as well as the purchase invoice in, in X3. Make sure that those are all posted and there are utilities to do mass updates and closures of those as well. In addition to that, for folks that are using uh, the bank posting feature, and I don't know if anybody's aware of this, but you could have a number of different steps from the time cash is received, received to the time it, was, it is actually posted to the bank, in other words, the debit or credit to your, your bank accounts uh, and the offsetting to receivables or payables. So make sure that you run that utility that can basically capture all of those transactions together. Uh, in addition to that, uh, because it is year-end, think about the fact that inventory is important. Most companies go through physical inventory accounts if they don't have a qualified cycle counting program. You know, we always emphasize that everybody should try and get away from doing physical inventories when they can, and the best way to do that is to have a, a certified cycle counting program in place that is guaranteeing that your inventory accuracy begins to approach 95 to 99% accuracy. Well, in addition to that, from an inventory perspective, we also have work in progress as well as subcontract um, management. Subcontracting with working with vendors, if you will, and outside services, you know, they, they run in a similar fashion as if it's a work order. So logically look at your ledger and think about that utility that's out there and the validation processes for both work in process and subcontract management. And make sure you get all of those orders closed out and cleaned up and posted off to the ledger and costed appropriately before you move into the new year. In addition to that, uh, we need to take a look at what happens along with the general ledger. And you know, a good review and audit of all of your transactions, and if you're just recently going live with X3, these are some things that you should be doing weekly. But at the same time, you know that this should be a monthly activity as well. When we talk about these activities, we're, we're talking about how allocations are being managed for any journal entries that would occur either at quarter end, month end, or year end. Make sure that you know those allocations that could be from one account to other accounts are run. Make sure that any of the uh, accruals and provisions that you may want to record are taken into account and recorded appropriately, as well as any reversals from period to period. So uh, put on your audit hats 
and make sure you go back and look at each of your accounts, especially on the balance sheet side, to make sure that your liabilities and, and your assets, if you will, are all appropriately managed so that those clearing accounts are in tune with the provisions that you've set up for those accounts during the course of the year. In addition to that, fixed assets, if you're using the X3 fixed asset solution, it's going to be posting all of the different entries that are required. So if you have any gains or losses that have to be recorded from the sale or disposition of assets, make sure that you run those appropriate utilities that are designed to do the posting of those entries and then audit them to make sure that they tie back to what reasonably you believe should be there. In addition to that, for companies that work with multiple currencies, it's important to make sure that you run any of the utilities that are designed to manage that currency provision. Now those come with built-in reversing journal entries for the next period to make sure that you record those journal entries or run those utilities so that your receivables and payables can be properly valued when it comes to currency changes in the marketplace. In addition to that, as we move up the complexity ladder, for companies that work with both inter-site and or inter-company types of transactions, take into account any of the complexities associated with treasury functions, i.e. the movements of, of cash between different companies where appropriate. Make sure that those are all tight and sealed. Be sure that any of those journal entries that need to be uh, managed or moving entries through the clearing accounts that transfer activity in between the different sites or the different currencies is properly netted and the existing balance in those individual companies and sites is true. And in addition to that, there are a number of different variants, clearing accounts, things like uh, RNI, receive not invoice. This is the time of the year to make sure that you print the, the receive not invoice uh, uh, reports out or look at the appropriate inquiry screens and make sure that the values that are listed in there make sense and what you're seeing in those GL accounts, which should be associated with each one of these types of accounts, is true for the performance of your company. You know, and also, one trick that I've always found is that, or the tip I should say, is that in a number of these different clearance and variance accounts, you'll find that X3 tends to post things to these accounts that maybe the, the account code just doesn't have a GL account listed there. And this is a good time to take a look at those if you haven't done that already and make sure that those accounting codes have the appropriate fields filled out with the GL accounts that are not being hit. And that could be part of the reason why you have erroneous postings to variants and the default 99999 accounts, if you will. As we continue with the checklist, you know, some of the things that we begin to look at is, so what do we do with that final validation of journal entries? And if you notice, uh, almost all journal entries will be recorded in what's referred to as a temporary status. If any of those journal entries are linked to a document, i.e. an invoice or, or something like that, you won't be able to edit the journal entry itself because the document drives that. So don't get frustrated. You know, make sure that if, if the journal entry is posting correctly and you want to make a change to a journal entry, a lot of us will just say, oh, you know what, I'm just going to record an adjusting journal entry to fix that. And, and that's kind of what I would do at the, the last minute. You know, if you can't figure out how to do it, uh, by reversing things throughout the system, definitely record the journal entry and then come back to it another day. But at the same time, for those entries that are linked to documents, don't hesitate to press the oops button that is on a related invoice or other related document in the system and, and get that journal entry reversed, make the corrections in the appropriate or associated document, and let X3 repost it with the appropriate numbers. It can become more complex when you start to deal with dimensional codes that have to be posted and recorded, if you will. Hopefully, X3 has forced the users to fill out any dimensional fields at the time that the transaction was being created. But at the same time, if that hasn't happened and one has slipped through the cracks, keep in mind that you can always edit those and change them and repost where appropriate. Now, a pre-closing report is provided with X3. Now, the pre-closing report gets generated every time you try to close a period. And it goes through and it does a natural audit of all of these things we've been talking about in the checklist. 
And it's going to come out and it's going to tell you exactly where the problems are. Well, this is the good news. So it's a safety net. It's going to guide you through the process. And for me, I like to make it so that whenever I run that on a monthly basis, the fewer errors that it tells me that I need to fix, that means I'm getting better and better at having a fully controlled system in X3, and it should speed up your closing process. So please run that uh, pre-closing report, if you will, to find any of the blocking errors, and then make sure that you do final validations. Uh, and I said it's my month. It should be by month, if you will. Sorry about the, uh, the typo error there, uh, CPTVA out. So make sure you, you run that by month, uh, because if you haven't done it for several months, it will run quite a while, because it has to go through every transaction that's unposted to the ledger, and it has to change the statuses from temporary to final. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is once you move everything into that final status on your journal entries, you can't reverse that without going in and doing table maintenance. So be cautious with that one, and make sure you do everything that we talked about earlier on our checklist before you press that final validation button. And then ultimately, when you've been through all of those steps, you can begin to close the period. Now that includes the stock close and the period close and then ultimately year end. Now, I will share with you that when you close the 12th month of the year that's in your periods, if you make sure to close that 12th period, do a couple things. Make sure you uh, opened the following year uh, and at the same time, make sure that you've opened the periods in the following year as well. Uh, and the reason I say that is because whenever X3 goes through the year-end processing, it has to have the following year open. And at the same time, nobody's going to be able to post any transactions in X3 until you open your periods in years uh, in 2016 as it is. So, and this is going to create uh, the, the pre-closed report again. You can see that uh, you can you can find a, a couple of different reports out there that can give you the, the transactions that you want to view. But more than what's most important here is that you let the system begin to guide you through where those errors are. And most likely, as you begin to do these more and more each month, uh, you're going to find there are going to be fewer and fewer errors to worry about. That's a good thing. Well, closing the year in X3, uh, one of the things I'd like to point out is when you do, uh, right before you, you close the year, take some time to take a look at the um, uh, the entry type, if you will, the document types, if you will. And there should be one out there called NEWPR, for new period, right? And the new period is going to have a default journal. I like to keep it simple, NEWPR, and then a sequential counter. And these should already be set up as, as defaults in the system. Some things to point out are that for those of us that are typically only running one ledger, you'll find here that there should just be the legal one authorized. The other ones should not. And if these two are also authorized, when you go to run the year-end close function, it's going to be looking for additional documents and a lot of other things that aren't necessarily required for North America. They're more required for the European uh, part of our business, okay, for companies in, in the European environment, if you will. Uh, but here in North America, from a GAAP perspective, those two should be set to none so that when you close the year, it knows how to find the correct a journal, if you will, uh, and, and post that uh, journal entry appropriately. Some other things to point out as we go through the system that X3 itself is designed to uh, record a number of different entries. And I mentioned earlier about the year-end simulation. So after you run uh, the closing for the final period, for the you know, month 12, if you will, you can go run the, you can find the financials, utilities, year in simulation. Run this utility, and it should aggregate itself for each year as you close each year. So in other words, when you run it this year, it should be saying for next year. So it's going to be a simulated entry. It's only going to be visible in a specific number or a specified number of reports. So if it's a simulated journal entry, it really means nothing uh, except for when you run those certain reports, kind of like the trial balance, and you'll see that beginning balance out there, but you won't see a journal entry per se. A couple of other things to keep in mind, you know, as you close the year, 
So there are a couple of different uh, setup parameters uh, that, that you need to, to take a look at. Uh, you also need to make sure that, and I mentioned this earlier, make sure that your fiscal years are open. Okay, so the idea is at the bottom of the screen for 2016 when you go into your fiscal years as well as your fiscal periods, make sure you hit the opening button and then when you come back onto this screen, you'll see the status move from not open to open, to open up all of, open the next year as well as all of the periods within that year. Okay. Oh, side note, under general parameters, there's something called ENDDAT. Right. Make sure that's out a couple of years into the future. Uh, this is the one that kind of drives whether or not journal entries can begin to be posted into that next period. So if, if yours has been set for 12-31-2015, when you try to post things to the ledger on January 4th when we all come back to work, uh, the system will just get hung up and you won't see anything hitting the ledger. And it's because of this general parameter, typically. A couple of other things, and these are all kind of numbered out, you know, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yeah, just follow along with, with this list of things. Execute the dimension balance recovery function if necessary. And a lot of people ask me, so, so what is that? Well, the dimensions sit in tables. They're analytical dimensions, if you will. And you know, by the way, all this stuff kind of all comes together eventually, depending on what legislative environment you're in. They, they all have purpose. Uh, but what can happen is the tables can get out of balance. I mean, it's rare. It's rare. Uh, but if that does happen, you can run this utility, and it will resynchronize what are referred to as the dimensional balance tables along with the general ledger balance tables. So that's something that's probably worthwhile to run once a year. And how do you know if they're out of balance? Well, you'll find that in various different reports, especially if you're working with Sage Intelligence. Uh, or Sage uh, Enterprise Intelligence, and sometimes there'll be numbers in there that are dimensional reports and you go into X3 and they don't necessarily tie. Well, that's probably because the tables are not in sync. And people ask me, well, what could cause that to happen? Usually, this I've only ever seen this really occur whenever people are importing data uh, at the beginning of their, their life with X3. And sometimes the data isn't imported into all the appropriate um, tables. Well, most of the consultants with X3 will run this utility to make sure everything is balanced. But if they do happen to get out of balance because somebody has created some journal entries or did some table maintenance within X3, run this and it will resync those. You'll also find this uh, visible whenever you go into the account balance screen for a specific GL account. Choose the tab that shows the balance by period and you'll begin to see a balance at the bottom of the screen as well as a balance in the header of the screen. If those two are different, that typically means that the tables are out of sync. Some other things that you may want to uh, uh, take into account, for example, we already know, know this one, number four, make sure all invoices are validated. Five, all receipts and payments must be validated. So you know, run that batch posting if you need to catch anything that may have slipped through the cracks. And all recurring journal entries must be generated and posted. The final validation must be performed on all journals prior to closing. Price updates for the next year must be entered as well. Now, that's not going to prevent you from closing uh, the year, but it's just good to know that if you have any price books out there, either on the sales or the purchasing side, vendor or customer side, a lot of those have date references uh, from two. Well, rather than creating new price books, just extend the, the end date if you need to, especially if the price books or whatever you have in those programs are not changing. If you need to, you can always index them. You can increase the price prices by given percentages. Take a look at those screens and see if there's anything in there that can be of help in making that decision. Now, talk a little bit about cost transfers, cost calculations, and the like. With NX3, there are, and most people know this, there are actually four buckets uh, for capturing cost. There's your standard cost, there's revised cost, there's a budgeted cost, and then there's a simulated cost. But what a lot of people don't know is that when you're trying to figure out how to get new, better costs for the following year, and that drives potentially your inventory valuation, what I like to do is I like to take the current year standards 
copy them over into the budgeted um, cost bucket for the next year, 2016, and then work on that. And then once I'm happy with those, transfer them into the standard for 2016. The good news here is you can do cost roll-ups for any of those buckets, and then you can move them back and forth. Don't make the mistake, however, of copying things from a, a future year to a prior year. And in fact, you shouldn't be able to do that. If anybody run across, runs across the ability of transferring costs from a future year to a prior year, please let me know. In addition to that, steps 10 and 11 uh, are important. Now, close all periods for the current fiscal year. That's kind of going to be the final thing that you Now, I will share with you that it, it's not advisable to close out the fiscal year on December 31st of this year. You don't have to do that. Just close out the period. And then leave the fiscal close. Let that go for a month or two. You know, you may want to do a little bit of auditing of the system in January. There are going to be different numbers that, that come and go. Uh, so kind of leave that one open. You don't have to run that close the fiscal year out uh, for quite a while. And in fact, a lot of companies won't close the fiscal year out until the final audit has been completed, whether it's an internal audit or an external audit, depending if you're publicly or privately held. Uh, but make that decision down the road. Next year is going to be fine. Uh, it's going to make sure that all, it'll basically ensure all of your numbers are good, but you won't see any of the closure of um, uh, current earnings uh, from the P&L side up into retained earnings until you run that uh, year-end closure utility in that books that journal entry for you automatically. So, and number 11, all users must be out of X3. In other words, everybody out of the pool. When you run the year-end function, there are a number of different things that it does to update the integrity of various different date-based fields and control fields. And because of that, uh, X3 kind of suggests get everybody out of the pool, uh, close down the, uh, the uh, accounting posters, if you will. Uh, it'll actually even tell you to do that. It'll shut it down. And remember, you may need to restart those up so that the entries are being reposted into the ledger. Now, when you do run closing the year, Okay, as we run the, the fiscal year end closing utility, it's going to create the year end journal, which we talked about earlier, that NEWPR. When you run that utility itself, a screen's going to pop up and it's going to begin to ask you things like what company, uh, what references, what ledger, and then you know any additional documents and journals, and then there's that closing document feature there on the right hand side. Most important is before you run this live, at the bottom you'll notice there's a simulation checkbox. It's safe to run it in a simulation mode. And as a matter of fact, I would recommend that you do that. And it's going to give you an idea of what the journal entry is that's going to be generated once you run this for true posting to the ledger. So run the simulation mode on this, uh, and then come back after you review what it's going to create. And if the numbers look pretty good, then just go ahead and run it and post it. Now, the good news with an X3, not that there's, there's bad or negative news, is that in fact, when you do close the year, it's going to create a journal entry. And as most of us know, when there's a journal entry created in an X3, you can actually do reversals of that. Uh, one of the nice things about X3 is if you, if you do run the year and close, and you have to reopen the year, uh, there's a utility to reopen the year. Now, that's just on the ledger side. There's no utility to reopen contexts that are on the fixed asset side. So be very gun shy before you close out any of the context periods in X3. But from this perspective, it will create a reversing journal entry for that year-end journal entry, if you will. Uh, and then whenever you run the year-end close again, after you may have recorded any correcting journal entries, you can just go and reclose the year, the same with the period. If you do end up having to reopen any periods, you have to sequentially open them one at a time, going backwards from, from December to November to October, so on and so forth. The next three will kind of walk you through that when you run that specific utility. A few other considerations. When you're thinking about uh, closing things down for a year, 
an X3. And, and I've kind of emphasized these several times during the course of this presentation this afternoon. Uh, fixed assets, context, and periods must be opened and or posted. Uh, if you're not familiar with how the context area of fixed assets works, please do not hesitate to reach out to either myself or somebody here at RKL. We would be more than happy to make sure that everything is tuned and working appropriately and walk you through those steps to make sure that you're comfortable as well. At the same time, budgets. There are two types of budgeting. Uh, uh, there's two types of budgeting functionality in X3. Uh, one is the classic uh, financial budget. Uh, so if you are using that feature, make sure that you create new budget codes for the following year. And the good news here is there's a feature where you can copy one budget code to the next for, so it would, be, it would be open for the next period. Operational budgets. Kind of like how do you manage your CapEx, right? Uh, there are carryover budgets for that. So if, if you are using operational budgets uh, and there are carryovers, make sure that you run the utilities to calculate those carryovers for the next period of time so that that value can be transferred into the carryover budget field that is linked to each one of the operational budgets or envelopes that are associated with that functionality. And again, those are kind of um, unique areas of, of X3. Uh, if you're not comfortable with it and you'd like some additional assistance, don't hesitate to reach out to our consulting team so that we can assist you with that. We did talk about updating the standard costs, the bonds and the routings and the like. Uh, and again, that's another area. If you're not comfortable there, uh, let us assist you with that. And we're certain that uh, if you get through that once, uh, you'll be pretty good to go the next time around. Now, uh, and that also relates to your inventory valuation and your, your cost roll-ups with revaluations. Now, the thing that I do want to point out, whenever you do run your inventory uh, valuation, uh, as well as whenever you run your, your cost roll-up, uh, the system, if you tell it to at the bottom of the screen, it will record the adjusting entry to revalue your inventory. So when you run your cost roll-up, that final step with your new standards, if you will, uh, after you run it in a simulated mode, make sure you check the box when you run it a second time if the numbers look good uh, and you agree with what uh, the new values of your products are going to be. And it's okay to even run a comparison report to see what they are now and what they will be in the future period and compare them side by side. Exception-based reporting is always a good thing if you know where I'm coming from. And at the same time, when you run that cost roll up one more time, choose update cost and it's going to change the value of your inventory and record the appropriate journal entry for revaluation. Choose the timing of that. Some people will run that revaluation of inventory at the end of the year. Most companies, however, will run that in the new year, so you don't have to worry about recording any provisions for cost changes in the current year. In addition to that, we talked a little bit earlier about financial reporting considerations. You'll want to verify any of the report balances after year end and future opening balances. Okay. Remember, X3 is period specific. So when you run the calculations, it's going to go from period to period. So make sure you review those. A little known fact, a lot of times you can select the given field and you can drill down to the associated entries. They are all true. So make sure that you feel comfortable with any of those numbers being posted. And maybe the most simplest test would be to make sure that your assets and liabilities balance out in the system and your current earnings ties back to the P&L. It all kind of makes sense when you look at a trial balance and how the pieces come together. But those are often driven by different settings associated with the GL account numbers. So just make sure that your GL account numbers are noted as either balance sheet or P&L types of accounts, and that the coding structures, i.e. the 1 series, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 series uh, associations for your GL accounts uh, is appropriately linked to the category of balance sheet or P&L or capital. 1099s. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. We were talking about 1099 functionality. Uh, and it's found under uh, declarations. I know it's, it's kind of a funny word, uh, but fee declarations, if you will, is kind of a universal term 
that is used in a lot of different countries. Make sure you spend, you pay attention and you only look at the ones that are under the United States. That would be us. And in here, there are a number of different screens that you can go into after you do the calculations where you can actually do maintenance of the various numbers before you might send those forms out to the appropriate recipients. Uh, when it says type 1099 forms, the appropriate forms are not included in there. So if you are going to update any of the more recent 1099 forms, make sure you run a test before you start printing on new stock to send out to the recipients. I'm going to reemphasize the concept of fixed asset context. Now, one thing is that the fixed asset ledger is the only true subsidiary ledger within the X3 walls. And people say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, you've got the accounts receivable collective account. You have the accounts payable collective account. A lot of people would argue that, well, what about my inventory SOJO subledger, work in process, finished goods, raw materials, things like that, as well as, as the cash accounts or the bank accounts that are designed for reconciliation purposes, again, statements in the accounts, and then in the bank uh, reconciliation functionality is excellent in X3. Use it. If you're not, let us know. We'll help you through that. But at the same time, the fixed asset concept contacts themselves require closure. It's the only subsidiary ledger that requires closure, uh, other than regular period closures for each company and then financial year and closing in X3. So make sure that you get that under control uh, before you move forward. Default parameters. One of the last things that you want to do, uh, or the first thing that you do uh, during the first week when you get back from uh, Christmas break or the holiday break, if you will, uh, is make sure you go into your SUP DEF date ranges after the new year begins. And in here, you'll find, for example, default start date and default end date. Sometimes it's good to change those to be the current year. Now, what do these do? Just make it so that whenever you bring up any inquiry that is a date range-based screen, it will put these dates up as the default dates. This is kind of nice, so you don't have to worry about going up to the header of the screen every time and changing them from two years ago to the current year. So for those of you who have not updated any of these dates, you can go in at any time to make those changes and, and do so because it may make everybody's experience with X3 just a little nicer. And then finally, I mentioned this earlier, the fiscal year does not have to be closed immediately. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, it's recommended that you keep it open until that audit is, uh, is completed. Uh, the simulated year-end will update the beginning balances for most reports, so make sure that you run that simulated year-end feature uh, so that it can give you the appropriate opening balances for next year. And this is in lieu of running the financial year, the fiscal year-end utilities, and you don't have to worry about those additional journal entries. That will net itself out when you finally run the FYE. And posting areas can be challenging, and, and I can't emphasize this anymore. Uh, if you do run into any challenges with any postings, whether they're inventory-style postings or just things that are related to accounts receivable or accounts payable or what have you, please do reach out to RKL eSolutions Help Desk. It's a great place to ask questions. And on that note, I'd like to thank everybody and wish everybody a happy holidays. Uh, and there's some other things here that Walt's going to pick up on. So, Walt, if you're out there, uh, if I could change this over to you, maybe you want to open this up for questions uh, while have. the panel is active. That would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Before we open up the lines, we had one question submitted. And the question was, how can I get the checklist that you referred to earlier in the presentation? And I'll encourage everybody to send a, just a generic email request to sales at rklesolutions.com, right here on your screen, and we'll be happy to send that to you. Uh, so just send us an email, we'll get that back to you.